I'm so excited. Today we're going to see a really special tree with Vijay. It's a tree I've been dying to see with him. It is the colossal Siba. It is the giant of Lalbagh. It is by far the biggest and most spectacular tree I have ever seen. And most people who come all the way to Lalbagh come just to see this tree. But it's easy to go and see a tree and marvel at how big it is. It is something different to go with Vijay and understand the stories behind the tree. So if you're ready, let's go and see the colossal Siba. Welcome to Tree Spotting episode number 6. Let's go. This tree is very very grand. It's a hybrid between a Siba uh, from Ecuador and another one from Madagascar. Mm -hmm. First cultivated in Indonesia. It's a very vigorous hybrid, grows very fast, produces tens of thousands of pods which produce the silk cotton material throughout the Caribbean and in the West Indies. This tree is called this Sebo as they pronounce it, but Siba is written in English. And it's got this name Siba from the Taino Indian. So let's get this right. This tree is originally from Ecuador in South America. It has come around Africa, found the hybrid of the tree from Madagascar, gone all the way to Indonesia and eventually found its way to Bangalore. Wow. Vijay mentioned the Taino Indians. Have you heard of them? Well, when Christopher Columbus sailed west to find India in 1492, he landed in the Caribbean. He believed he had reached India and he called the locals Indians, a name that has stuck to this day. But who we encountered were the Taino Indians. They were the indigenous people of the Caribbean. They were later displaced by slaves brought in from Africa and are now extinct. And their sacred tree is the Siba. Fascinating, isn't it? Just look at the foliage. The incredible cover for this tree. Those leaves come from branches which get come together and each branch here is massive in size. Then you suddenly get the tree becoming sort of pinched together like an hourglass and then from that you have these snaking uh, buttresses flowing out which from end to end are about 70-75 feet. Now the buttresses serve many purposes but above all they spread the weight of the tree and of course they direct rain water down by the side and that water gets in where the buttresses end. It also enters the earth straight to the roots. But Vijay, somehow this tree doesn't look complete. The tree was very beautifully shaped earlier but on the south side You've got two huge branches which are cantilevered out, almost 80 feet and rising at the end. Another tree from behind actually fell on that and broke two branches and thereby crippling that section of the tree. Notice Arun, there's that knob-like portion which is like an elephant's knee. That's actually a characteristic of the seba that the lower branches are usually dropped by the tree and that is like the portion which is dropped healed over by the tree itself. You'll see it in many Seba trees. There's a reference in the Mahabharata to Pitamaha who created the world and universe and then reposed under a shalmali tree, which is a silk cotton tree. So even then there must have been silk cotton trees with buttresses like the one we see behind. So this is a hybrid. Where Pitamaha, who would have been really tired after creating the world and universe, would have reposed under two of the buttresses, would have been cradled and went off to sleep. The sense of awe is conveyed through this. The size of the tree, 
and, and the fact that if you had a tree, a tree to rest under, it would be this tree. Vijay, I just love how uh, you know this tree rises up, spreads out, and if I stand here, I, I can't even see the sky. That's true. Uh, in fact, the Taino Indians and the other tribes and communities living in Central Tropical America, the Caribbean, North of South America, they refer to this tree as being a connection between the earth and the heavens. Really? Uh, almost like an access Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, and to them it was sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the other hand, tribes who were uh, absolutely uh, stunned by the size of the tree, they refer to demons resting in the tree. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think uh, it, it's very believable <laughs> if I came on this tree at night that I could believe that there are yeah. demons residing in here. But the reference to the connection between earth and heaven is so real and only when you stand here you can, you can appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. So this is the silk cotton tree. I see neither silk nor cotton. I just see a massive tree. That's absolutely uh, correct. Where is the silk in this? In this tree, you will have hundreds and hundreds of flowers. Okay. And flower buds both coming up together. Okay. And the flowers will be a salmon pink color mm -hmm. and ultimately will lead to pods mm -hmm. which are boat shaped and which hang. And when the summer's heat comes on, those pods break open. Okay. And when they break open, you get this silk cotton material coming out. Why don't you pick up that silk cotton material, which, we, which is there? Very soft, is it? Yes, it's neither silk nor cotton. That's why it's called silk cotton. And embedded are the seeds inside. So, so this is the seed. Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. And when the wind blows, mm -hmm. it goes with the, the silk cotton material, actually floats in the air, takes the seed with it, and it goes a distance and new life begins there. Did you know? The Taino Indians gave us the word Siba in the English language, but they also gave us the word Canoe. They used to make dugout boats from the Siba's branches. Another word they gave us is Barbecue, Hammock, Tobacco. They were clearly a very laid back fun people. In the earlier episodes always come out with one stunning story about each tree. So I'm really waiting. The tree is standing by itself, but I'm, I'm fairly certain you have something even more to tell me. So. You play cricket, don't you? Yes. yes. Uh, you see me cricket matches in DDCA, that is Delhi Cricket Stadium. I haven't seen the stadium, but yeah, I know that. Yeah. Uh, it's next to what's called Farosha Kotla. And there is a connection between Farosha Kotla and a, and a column on that on the topmost terrace of Farosha Kotla mm -hmm. and this tree. Stories a little involved but absolutely fascinating. I'm all here. Uh, in 1372, uh, Farosha Tukluk uh, found a polished sandstone column at a place called Chunar, mm -hmm. not very far from Banaras. It was about 30, 32 feet in length and weighed about 30 tons, beautifully punished with a script which, which narrated something which he was completely unaware of. And that script was the Brahmi script, which was five centuries afterwards, actually deciphered by James Princep. And it was in Ashoka, uh, edict actually. Ashoka Pillar. Yes, Ashoka Pillar. So it goes back to about 230 BC. Okay. Now this column was a trophy for Tukluk. Was so impressed by it mm -hmm. and the polish given to it and the color of the sandstone that he decided to bring it and put it in his fort in Delhi. He decided to bring it from 
Yes, 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 Delhi. yes. And so he let it be known that he wants everybody uh -huh. to bring in enough silk cotton material to make about four feet thickness mm -hmm. around this uh, pillar mm -hmm. which was standing upright. Okay. Then having got that, he slowly lowered the pillar mm -hmm. onto this silk cotton material okay. which is produced by a tree like this. Mm -hmm. And then he wrapped it up in uh, reeds and ram skin okay. for protection. Then he got three, four bullet cuts again put in a bed of silk cotton mm -hmm. and lowered this on that mm -hmm. and it was taken to the river Ganges mm -hmm. where a few boats were lashed together mm -hmm. and this was laid on it. It wow. went up to Ilhabad on the Ganges uh -huh. and then into the Jamna uh -huh. and when it got to Delhi the river Jamnas used to actually be on the side of Farosha Kotla. Oh, yes, the waters lapped the walls of Farosha Kotla. Quite far now, right? Yamuna yes, yes, it's, yes, yes, yes. The river has moved mm -hmm. uh, considerably, about seven, eight miles actually, over time. And from there, he raised it again with the use of silk cotton material, uh -huh. all the way nine floors up wow. onto the terrace of Farosha Kotla. Wow. And there it is standing out, facing the sky vertically. Uh, even today. I see. So the Ashoka pillar you see in Kotla today yes. is the one brought by Sirosha Tuklat in the 14th century all the way from somewhere near Banaras yes. by Rishik. And the uh, silk cotton of a tree like this was yes. important. Yes. Uh, not only important, might have been the best impact protection material they knew of in those days. That is what it was used for. The pillar came without any damage? Curious. Yes, it wasn't damaged. Uh, so you are connecting Emperor Ashoka, the pillar near Banaras, the river Ganga, Tirosha Tuglak, Tirosha Kotla, Cricket, and you are putting it all together sitting under this wonderful silk cotton tree in Lalbagh, Bangalore. Wow, thank you. That was uh, uh, <laughs> Is uh, else? <laughs> uh, I'm not connecting this. It's always been there. It's yeah, a question you know, it's, of... Uh, it's in front of our eyes and we don't know it. And, uh, I'm but fairly confident that if I if I Google this now, I won't get it. Because what I've discovered in your stories is that they're not just there. You have constructed them, you have pieced it together, you have found sources. So if I and I challenge you all to do it, if you just go and Google uh Lalbagh silk cotton tree, uh Pirosha Kotla, uh, you will not get a result until maybe after this episode. And in fact most of the stories that Vijay has told me. I've always gone to verify and I don't find them in the same way. So uh, I think it is just incredible how you're able to connect all these different pieces of information, trivia, history, and bring it all together uh, in front of a wonderful tree. Thank you so much for that. This tree is called the Seba Pendentra mm -hmm. because the leaves appear in a cluster of five. This particular tree or species, uh, because of its size and the energy needed, it does not necessarily flower and set fruit every year. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be once in two, three years. In fact, this tree did not have flowers for about 12 years when I studied it. Really? Then one year, I saw a section up there, that side, which had these beautiful salmon pink flowers, but only a section. On reading up on this kind of thing uh, in botanical literature, I found out the tree often doesn't have enough energy for the whole tree across a huge size like this uh, to produce flowers. So it produces in a section. Uh, but even otherwise, even if there's a smaller tree and the flowers come everywhere, it doesn't necessarily flower every year. Now when it does flower, you have these beautiful salmon pink flowers and uh, there's a lot of nectar. Mm -hmm. I've read about a tree uh, in Sierra Leone, exactly the same species, where the tree puts out the unbelievable 
25 liters of nectar a night through the flowers to make it interesting from bats which stay 20 miles away to fly across every night and and thereby pollinating the trees also 20 miles away. yes <laughs> this is also pollinated by nocturnal moths Wasn't that fantastic? I mean, I've seen a lot of trees, a lot of big trees by myself and with Vijay, but something about this tree just, it just blows your mind. Uh, every time I come here, it, it just does something to you. Uh, this, while the sheer scale is obviously staggering, uh, I, I can use lots of adjectives, colossal, a behemoth, gargantuan, it is giant. But more than the scale, there is something special about the way it looks, it feels. And now that I know the stories behind it, next time I come here, I'm going to be, it's going to be taking me to a different place altogether. When I think of Bhishma, when I think of Feroz Shah Tughlaq, boy, it, it just, it just boggles the mind. And I encourage all of you, come to Nalbad, come to the street, spend some time, it's, it's special. Thank you.